and then it's, that's the note there, and then you got the note there, uh huh, and then there's notes here, uh huh, and there, uh huh, and then you can do the, these notes here. Okay, um, Billy, thank you. Those those are great notes. Can you uh, do me a favor with those? Yes, sir. What, what would you like to do with these notes? Can you take those and put those in the trash can? Oh, what? Uh, take those notes. Uh huh. Put them in the trash can. <laughs> no, 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 no. See, and I, I'm not trying to offend you in any way. I, you know, I love you, Billy. Oh, thank you. Oh, well, thank you, sir. Can I hug it? No, no, you don't need to hug me. Um, I'm just saying these notes are great for kind of spurring ideas and giving thoughts and, and all of that. But I don't need that. I we The whole point of the James Arnold Taylor podcast is I just kind of go from the top of my head and we just have fun. But then the notes sir, I wrote down in, in the, a shorthand and I don't even understand. Well, that also makes it all that much worse because I don't understand your shorthand. I don't either, but uh, okay, I'll just throw them away. Okay, very good, Billy. Thank you, sir, Mr. James, sir. Just James. James, sir, James. Not Sir James. James, sir. Okay. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. James Arnold Taylor here. Welcome to the James Arnold Taylor podcast. Uh, Billy, the intern, Billy the intern, a uh, great kid, made a bunch of notes. Apparently, he's been following me uh, for the last week, writing down pretty much everything I say. Which <laughs> and he was trying to, he thought that those, that would then, because I guess at some point I said, you know, it'd be great if you had like the ability to just go back, like on your iPhone, how you can go back and find things of just find stuff that you say uh, when you've forgotten it. Because, you know, so we say a lot of things in life and if we don't write them down, which I try to write down as many things as I can. But so I guess he took that as he should make notes. So he wrote down notes of everything I've said over the last week. And uh, and none of it. I'm not going to use any of it. That's not how the James Arnold Taylor podcast rolls. That's not how we roll. Again, because I like that expression, even though it means nothing. Um, So he's a sweet kid and he meant well and God bless him and I I love him for it. And I'll get him. I'll get him a nice gift. Don't you worry. All right. Because the holidays are approaching. We are look at we are in the thick of it. Have you done your holiday shopping yet? I have to say, you know, now here's the problem. My wife does listen to this podcast from time to time. I have done some shopping for her. I've done some for my daughter. My daughter listens as well. So I can't say what I've gotten either one of them, but I can say this. Some gifts have been purchased. Plus my daughter, or rather my wife's birthday was uh, just this last week. So here's the thing. Do you have a birthday that falls around the holidays? Because if so, people that buy you gifts, so like I, so my, my wife's birthday is the 30th of November. Then you've got Christmas. Then February rolls around and then it's my daughter's birthday. So I have to get gifts just like you just have to like get and then you have to choose. Well, this one will be for the birthday and this one will be for the holidays and this one, you know, this for Christmas. And this is, you know, so anyways, uh, but I've done some of that. I hope you have. You know, I I thought about doing like a a holiday special, like a James Arnold Taylor holiday special. You know, maybe I'm going to save that for next year when the whole podcast is really kicked off and been good and uh, I don't know. I say that, and then next week I may end up doing a, a big holiday thing. You just never know. I could bring Santa Claus. Oh, I could bring Santa Claus in. I could interview Santa Claus. Look at that. I could interview Santa Claus and some of his elves. That no, okay. Now see. All right. All right. See, that's what Billy. Write that. Write that down. Billy. <laughs> yes, sir. I heard that. I'm gonna write it with the holiday. I like the elves in the. Okay. Good. Yeah. Get that. Okay. <laughs> That might be fun. You guys might like that. And I could read some holiday things. Tell, Let me know. Okay, everybody that's listening to this, this one is going to come out. Let's see. Okay, so today is today is December 3rd. The next podcast comes out on the 5th. So the one after that comes out on the 12th. So I could record a holiday one. Well, no. Okay, for the 19th. Because this one is the 12th. This one right now that you're listening to right now will air on the 12th. Will come out. December 12th, 2018. So I could, yeah, on the 19th, the next week's one, I could put one out that's a holiday one, or I could put one out before Christmas. Well, see, Christmas falls on uh, Tuesday this year, which is kind of weird. So I'm going to do that. I'll, okay. All right. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. <laughs> All right. Um, hey, Mr. Announcer Guy, we should uh, we really should just get on with the show. Yes, James. You know what to do, baby. Yes, I do, baby. <laughs> just sorry, I called you baby. That's all right, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, 
It's the James Arnold Taylor Podcast. Talking to myself. Now, here he is. The guy that thinks he'll do a Christmas special even though he doesn't have it planned. James Arnold Taylor! You're just getting bigger and bigger with that. You're like, you know, kind of in the vein of like the old David Letterman ones that I loved. Uh, that's that's good. Yes, I watched a lot of Letterman as a kid. Yeah, me too. Of course you did. You're me. Oh yeah, and I'm you. Right on. Groovy. All right, now we're going back. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a child of the 60s, but we're using Groovy and stuff like that. I'm going to split now, baby. Oh, you're keeping in with the whole Groovy 60s voice. Okay, bye-bye. Well, it is the James Arnold Taylor podcast, um, and, you know, I have a lot. I do actually have things planned for you today, even though I'm talking about how I, I go from the hip on this. There is, I talked about this, I believe, on one of the last episodes. Again, I record some of these, and then I put them out, and I hold on to some, and then, you know, whatever. So you may have noticed on the last podcast, for example, uh, Bob, hey, Bob, Bob, did not read the emails. Now, the reason for that is that episode uh, had been recorded before Bob had, you see. So there you go. Um, and so, uh, and then I held it and put it back and moved it around. So Bob will be here to answer emails later today on the James Arnold Taylor podcast because you all love Bob already. I love that you love Bob. I love Bob. Hey, Bob, 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 Bob. There is a story about, yeah, Bob, but I'm not, I can't, I can't tell you where it came from. Anyways, but it's funny. It's cute. All right. Uh, <laughs> and we have something that I mentioned uh, rather than a, in one of the last podcasts. I, so years ago I did Big Pop Fun, my good friend Tom Wilson's podcast, and I recorded three episodes for him. I only aired two of them. The third one was an interview I did with Dave Filoni, the director of Clone Wars. And uh, we sat down at Rancho Obi-Wan and did this interview back in, oh my gosh, I don't even know when, probably 2013, maybe? Yeah, it might have been like five years ago. I think it was. I'll, I'll find out for sure. And this is segment one. Now, some, one of somebody, uh, you know what? I'll have to see if I can figure out who. One of you wrote to me and said, somebody put, hang on, I'm going to find it. Uh, one of you uh, wonderful people that writes to me said, if I put these uh, Dave Filoni ones in, I should call it the Filoni Files. I thought that was funny. I'll find it. I'll figure it out. Whoever, I've given you credit. I just want to give you credit. Whoever, whoever said that, God bless you. That's funny. That if I put in, uh, yeah, I can't find it. Anyway, okay. So segment one, part one of my interview with Dave Filoni is on this podcast today. Hey, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, then part two will come up. And since this is my way of stringing you along to listen to my podcast, if you're brand new to the podcast today, because of the Dave Filoni interview, you're seeing it and you're going, oh, I want to hear that interview. And you don't know who I am. Well, I'm James Arnold Taylor. I'm the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi on Star Wars The Clone Wars, as well as Jedi Master Plo Koon, Koton Yaw. Uh, Dave Filoni's favorite character, as a matter of fact. I don't know if he still is. He might not be anymore, but he was uh, when we made the show. He may not be now because I voiced him. No, I kid. But uh, if you're new to the show, welcome. Uh, this is Talking to Myself. I am James Arnold Taylor. I do a bunch of voices on the show, and uh, I'm known for my voices in cartoon and animation, film, uh, television, uh, radio, all that stuff. Uh, notably, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Ratchet from Ratchet and Clank, Titus from Final Fantasy, uh, Fred Flintstone, Johnny Test... Spider-Man, The Flash, and many more. So welcome. So I'm going to interview, uh, or I'm going to play that interview. So I'll play that interview with Dave Filoni here, and that'll be fun. And we're going to talk to some other of my characters and everything. And, uh, you know, just going to have a good time. But, you know, who? hey, you know what we should talk about? I've been talking about talking about talking about this. <laughs> if you can follow me. Obi-Wan Kenobi in Battlefront 2. And I... I it, Many things to say about this. The first being, I'm glad that I can actually talk about it now because it's out. Obi-Wan is there. You can play as Obi-Wan Kenobi in Battlefront 2. And that's great. Now, here's the thing. I guess I could have said, if people said, are you Obi-Wan Kenobi in Battlefront 2? I could have said yes, because originally, if you, you want to know the truth, I voiced Obi-Wan Kenobi in a game called Battlefront 2 back in 2002, I think. 2002 or 2003, there was the first version of this game 
And I voiced Obi-Wan in that. So, yes, I did. But uh, there was the big whole story was going to be, uh, you know, is it going to be James Arnold Taylor voicing Obi-Wan Kenobi in Battlefront 2? Or is it going to be Ewan McGregor voicing? Or is it going to be somebody else? Or what is the deal going to be with Obi-Wan once they announced that they were going to do a Clone Wars section of Battlefront 2? So that has been going on for months. People have been asking me and wanting to know. And of course, you as a voice actor, you sign NDAs and you can't disclose information. And so you don't and also you don't want to give anything away. So I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want to give anything away. But for months now, I've known. Yes, of course. Just like with the Clone Wars coming out, I knew it was coming out, but you can't say anything. So I enjoyed all of the banter that happened before all of that, of people guessing and wanting to know. The things that bug me, you know, what what is it that bugs me about all of it? Uh, you know, not to be negative, because, you know, I'm a positive person. I try to stay as positive as I can. The, what bothers me is all the people that are, and, and and this is fascinating to me as well, and maybe we can just talk about this for a minute. The people that are huge fans that only wanted you and McGregor. So I have to imagine if you're a Ewan McGregor Obi-Wan fan, you're a fan of the prequels. If you're a fan of the prequels, how are you not a fan of Clone Wars? That's what boggles my mind. If if you're somebody that grew up going, no, I like the prequels. I love Obi-Wan Kenobi, young Obi-Wan and everything. How can you not like the TV show Clone Wars? And I'm not saying you have to like me as Obi-Wan Kenobi, but I'm saying, how could you not know or like that? And and there's a lot of people out there that are like, you know, who's this guy voicing uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. It's Ewan McGregor. It's like, and they, they're not really aware of Clone Wars. I find that fascinating. So anyways, that's, yeah, that, we can go off on a tangent on that forever, but that's all I wanted to say about that is all of you people that were really, really wanting Ewan McGregor to voice Obi-Wan in Battlefront 2, I'm sorry. Uh, it's me. However, does it make more sense to have Ewan or does it make more sense to have me? Well, you can say, well, it's Ewan's body and it's his face. But really, it's. It, I would argue to say, no, it's the face and body of Obi-Wan Kenobi. So who has been the actor that has portrayed Obi-Wan Kenobi over the last, now coming up on 18 years? That's me. So I'm not saying it like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm so cool or this or that or the other. But I'm also not saying it like, oh, gee, I'm, I'm the second rate Obi-Wan. I'm the, because I'm not. Okay. I just, I, I think after... After being a character for 18 years, it entitles me the ability to say, I'm this character, I have voiced this character, I know this character, I know the ins and outs of this character, I'm probably the best person for for portraying him in a game or a, a show that is going to embody all of these aspects of him. Because I started as Obi-Wan really doubling Ewan McGregor, then playing him in two different cartoons uh and and a film that was from the cartoons and then games and so and i have i have played him in all aspects of this character so for me to be able to voice him on battlefront 2 i think it makes the most sense if i wasn't the actor playing him i would say that makes the most sense i think it makes the most sense to get matt lanter to play anakin now some of you are huge hayden christensen fans you know i get it you're huge Hugh McGregor fans. I get it. I appreciate that. I love that, that you're fans of their their work and those films. I love that you love the prequels. That's fantastic. I would hope you'd have a love and respect for Clone Wars as well, because it was the most important Star Wars work over the last 10, 15 years. It really was. I think it's more important than these last movies that came out, because quite frankly, I don't think you would have had any of it were it not for the Clone Wars. So this is where James gets on his his Clone Wars, Star Wars hi-hat for a while. But uh, I, I mean that with all sincerity. You don't have Star Wars the way that it currently is without Star Wars, the Clone Wars running for six, uh, well, for five seasons on Cartoon Network, six uh, seasons on Netflix. It's also the last George Lucas Star Wars. So it's so important to canon. It's important to the Star Wars universe. And I think that it's, High time, everybody just recognize that we weren't just some cartoon uh, act voice over people doing impressions of characters. We were actors hired to portray characters in a different and new format. And we did. 
And that format took off and became something much bigger than most of the naysayers and the haters expected it to be, even so much so that now they all like Ahsoka Tano. They love Clone Wars, you know, or they love Ahsoka Tano. They, they, they love and respect what this, they even love and respect the fact that Darth Maul came back. Now there's, yes, you're, some of you are going to go, no, I didn't like that and all that. Fine, whatever. If you want to be a hater, be a hater. Uh, I, I commend your stick to to it, but. If you're a lover of Star Wars and the stories of the Clone Wars, I would hope you would appreciate the work that I have done, Matt Lanter has done, Ashley Eckstein, Catherine Tabor, uh, D. Bradley Baker, Tom Kane, Corey Burton, Nika Futterman, Jim Cummings, Phil Lamar, all these folks that have added to the Star Wars universe and kept it alive, quite frankly, for over a decade, okay? So that's my little <laughs> preamble to being in Battlefront 2. Now, let me talk about being in Battlefront 2. Was it fun? Yes. Being in Battlefront 2, so much fun. So great to do that and to work with the directors and the folks there at uh, DICE in EA. And they we, we sh- uh, recorded at uh, a studio out in Burbank where it used to be the old Technicolor Studios. And now it's a different studio. And uh, I'm not going to get into in depth on names and stuff because you know it's uh we need to keep some secrecy of things of where things are recorded but uh anyways at one point in time it was a studio for technicolor and it was the studio where i recorded uh, most of the ratchet and clank games that i did so i was in there on the mic that i recorded ratchet and clank for years this time recording Obi-Wan Kenobi. And you can see footage of it. It's out online. You can see bits and pieces. Um, the Star Wars channel, StarWars.com, they did a nice piece there on me uh, that came out uh, the other week. Uh, Anthony uh, interviewed me there, and that was very nice of him to do that and for them to put that all on there. And we had a great time. Matt Lanter joined me that day, but I had gone in prior to that and recorded a bunch of Obi-Wan Kenobi lines because we knew Obi-Wan would be released before Anakin. And so I had uh, recorded, just as Matt Wood had recorded Grievous before all of us, and Sam Whitmer had recorded Darth Maul before I was in there. So we recorded, I believe, I believe, I don't know, yeah, I believe all that's been recorded beforehand, uh, Sam's Darth Maul stuff. Anyways, uh, the cat's out of the bag. We're all voicing these characters. You all know that. So so how long does it take to voice Obi-Wan Kenobi in a Battlefront game? Uh, it takes about an hour and a half. I think is about all it took. And a lot of that time was us talking and chatting up and uh, talking about Star Wars and Clone Wars and all of that. And we had a good time doing it. So you go in, uh, your lines are listed, as I've mentioned before, for a video game, they're listed more so in an Excel document. So I do not see the other dialogue. I don't see what else is going on. And with Obi-Wan in a game like this, a lot of it is just more phrases and things that he's saying during battle. If you've played the game, you've heard it, you've known it, uh, you, you've seen and heard, there. it's a combination of lines of dialogue from the Clone Wars as well as the prequel films. So I'm saying lines that are my Obi-Wan's lines, and I'm saying lines that that are Ewan's Obi-Wan's lines, but they are all the character of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so they're not all always going to be done exactly as I read them in Clone Wars or as Ewan McGregor read them, because I, you know, I think that's the thing is people get kind of hung up on this whole thing of it's got to sound exactly the same. So the very first big line, this line that everybody is so, so taken by now, hello there. Um, you know, it's it's a great scene. It's a great... Obi-Wan Kenobi lands there in front of Grievous and all of them and it says, hello there. And that's how he says it, right? Okay. So there it is. There's James Arnold Taylor doing Ewan McGregor saying hello there as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, do I say it just like that for the game? No, I don't. I say it a little different. I say it as my hello there. Because Alec Guinness said it, Ewan McGregor said it, and now James Arnold Taylor has said it. And each of us are our own individual actors. I was not hired to simply mimic and sound exactly like Ewan McGregor all the time. I was hired as a, as a, a match of his vocal abilities and tones and textures. And that's what I do. And then when the character became more so my character to portray over six seasons, now seven seasons of The Clone Wars, I... I made a conscious effort as well as I was directed by Dave Filoni and George Lucas to not consciously try to sound only like Ewan McGregor. How would Ewan McGregor say this line? What would me, what would Ewan do? No, I, I'm not I'm not doing that. WWE, uh, 
ED, right? And what would Ewan do? I'm an actor. First and foremost, I'm an actor. I'm not a mimic. I'm an actor. So when you hear Obi-Wan doing lines in Battlefront and their lines from the movies or their lines from the show, they may not sound exactly like they sounded in the movie. If that was the case, they could just lift the line, meaning take that actual audio and put it in. But instead, they have me say it the way I perceive it and see it. Now, look, does that mean I would record it only that way? No, I also would record, I would give, so we would do three in a row, an A, a B, and a C. And the A take would be generally the one that is as close to the original dialogue as possible. And I think actually on Battlefront, I gave only two takes. Some games, you only do two takes, uh, an A and a B. And, and we would do a C if I felt necessary. So I would say, hello there, hello there, hello there. You know, I might do a, 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 a third, but I didn't. I, I, I don't believe, well, I might have on that line. But yeah, uh, you know, uh, Alec Guinness, hello there. So I, I think that that's really what my hello there is, is a combination of both hello there and hello there. And it becomes hello there. It's a combination of the two, you see, because I'm always trying to pay homage to these actors, but I'm also, th- my voice of Obi-Wan comes from both of them, not just one of them anymore. So anyway, so we record, so I hope all of this makes sense. I hope I'm not coming off as angry, James. It's just, this is such, it's just one of those things that is so heated and debated and and all of that. And I think that you all just have to understand, I'm not trying to just copy exactly what Ewan McGregor does. I'm doing my own thing as this character because I've earned that as an actor now, you know? So, you know, people would say, Boy, Matt Lanter doesn't sound anything like Hayden Christensen. Exactly right. And he wasn't directed to sound anything like him. He was directed to do it his own way. So Matt is doing Anakin as Matt sees Anakin. Uh, Catherine Tabor is doing Padme as Catherine Tabor sees Padme Amidala. Tom Kane is doing Yoda that way. I am doing Obi-Wan that way. D is doing the clones that way. All right. We're, that's uh, Corey Burton is doing uh, uh, Count Dooku that way. So we are just performing in our own ways, these characters. So all of that said, if you are playing Battlefront with the hopes that it's going to sound exactly like Ewan McGregor or be the Ewan Obi-Wan experience, sorry, you're going to get James Arnold Taylor's Obi-Wan in there mixed in. You just are. So I actually like that it, it kind of looks like him but it sounds like my obi-wan and it's a combination i think that they made the right choice there now of course some people say well of course they did it that way just to save money yeah of course they did i'm not denying the fact that i'm cheaper than ewan mcgregor to hire to voice obi-wan kenobi i I mean obviously uh the other thing is is you know did they ask you no they didn't you know why because they went let's use the clone wars actors Because they also realize there's a huge contingency of Clone Wars fans that have grown up hearing Obi-Wan and Anakin sounding that way. Now, General Grievous is Matt Wood in the movies and here. So that's very convenient. That works out well. But I don't know. I just, I get kind of, I get, I don't like that everybody gets so hung up on it. However, I will say this. I would, I would see from what I'm looking at, it looks like the overwhelming majority of people really enjoy what I've done vocally for Obi-Wan in Battlefront 2, to which case I say, thank you so much. So I'm not trying to complain here. Please get me right here. It's just, uh, I'm trying to speak to those voices that say, well, why didn't you make it sound more like you and, or why didn't you do more of this and that? Because I didn't, I did it my way. I did it my way. Obi-Wan sings the best of Frank Sinatra. Okay. Um, was it fun? Yes. Do I expect to go back in? I don't know. I may. Who knows um, if they do updates or need new lines and such. But for now, I am done voicing Obi-Wan and I had a lot of fun. The last time I was in doing it, I did those voice, the voice for the trailer, you know, begun the Clone Wars has. The Clone Wars have begun. Well, I turned into Yoda just then. But um, which I really enjoyed doing and it was a lot of fun. I'll let you in on a little secret. I was a little hoarse that day that I recorded Obi-Wan like I am today. What happened today? Why am I hoarse today? Because I was at a lunch. And I was talking to somebody and eating at the same time, which is a dangerous thing to do sometimes. And I inhaled uh, and a piece of food went down my windpipe. And now here it is 
almost three hours later and I still have the kind of sound. Well, that's a killer. That'll mess me up for the next uh, day or so. But uh, anyways, um, but the day I voiced Obi-Wan, I was having a, some allergies. And uh, so, so you get, you suddenly get this, you know, you are my brother, Anakin. No, um, uh, you get some of that, Obi-Wan, for sure. The texture. Do I base, all of that said, do I base my, the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi on you and McGregor? Absolutely. But uh, because uh, Alec Guinness never really did any big yelling. He did, you know, run, Luke, run. Trust your feelings, you know, but that would be about it. He never really got loud, you know, as, as Obi-Wan, but Ewan did. And that's when he went into that more kind of textured voice. Uh, in fact, I think that was a Ask Jack question. Somebody uh, sent an email asking uh, for me to talk about that. So I'll talk about it now. Uh, if I come across that uh, person's, um, let me look, mm, let me look and see. Uh, yeah. Oh, so, uh, in fact, it was, no, it was a, uh, ask Jat. There's a, I'm going to jump to this one. Uh, Alex Putnam asks, I recently discovered the Jack cast have since binged every episode. Thank you. I've noticed that almost every time you've done the Obi-Wan voice, you make him calm and relaxed. However, I think one of the most interesting parts of Obi-Wan is all the emotional turmoil he goes through, like having to fight his own best friend, Anakin, watching Qui-Gon die and having to produce protect his ex-lover from the man that killed Qui-Gon. I don't really have a question. I just thought it might be a good topic to discuss. Okay, well, so thank you, Alex. Alex is talking about the various uh, emotional levels of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And yeah, absolutely. Those things came into play when I was uh, voicing him and, and thinking about him and whenever I think about him and, and voice him as, a, as, uh, as it were. In a game, especially. In games, you tend to have more shouted dialogue and you know things that have to play over uh sounds and music and you know battle sounds and stuff so so there is a bit more of that at times um the different layers however if I, if obi-wan is just talking to you calmly and saying you're listening to the james arnold taylor podcast he might sound more like this i mean it's it's different there's different layers of 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 obi-wan kenobi for sure so uh interesting thank you for that comment and there you go you know so um battlefront 2 i think it's a massively fun game uh, people will always ask, have you played the game? Yes, I've played a little. Uh, I've watched more of it than anything because you can see it so readily available on YouTube. I've watched some people's playthroughs of the character of Obi-Wan and I've watched that and I think it's great fun and it's fun to hear my voice in there. Do I still enjoy hearing my own voice in games? Absolutely. I, I have fun. I think it's a lot of fun. You know, I'm, I'm a performer. A lot of actors will tell you, oh, I can't watch myself. I don't want to hear myself. Yeah, you know what I say? I, I don't believe it. We're all performers. We're all hams. We're all egos. We like to hear ourselves. I like watching a finished project uh, and and hearing myself in it and seeing the work I've done. Um, not like I sit there going, I am so good, but I like it because that's the finished thing. I want to see the finished story. I wouldn't do something. I wouldn't do a project if I didn't believe in the project. So to then do the project and then never see it because, oh, I can't bother to hear myself. I can't stand hearing myself or listen. No, I want to see how my performance blended in with everybody else's stuff. And so I think that most actors uh, really are more like that. And the ones that say, I don't like to hear myself or yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't buy it anyways. Uh, so yes, I, I love, uh, what they've done with Battlefront. I, uh, Battlefront 2, I should say. I love what they're doing with it. I think that, uh, everybody is enjoying it and I am so grateful to get to play Obi-Wan in it. And I am so grateful to all of you that have enjoyed my version of Obi-Wan in Battlefront 2. Thank you. Thank you. So really all of this big hole going on and on and stuff. Uh, is my way of just saying thank you. And I, I'm trying to give you... See, there's not a lot I can really tell you. I, I They hired me. I came in. We had a great time talking Star Wars and Clone Wars and Obi-Wan. Then I went into the booth. I recorded all the dialogue. That took maybe 45 minutes to record all the dialogue. At the most, the rest of the time... We sat around talking Star Wars and characters and all of that. And that's, you know, and it's because it's just to say, because those lines of dialogue don't require a lot of um, time recording them. You record them uh, once or twice, uh, maybe three times. You say the lines and then, you know, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. I say it, you know, three different times. They they take their options. They take the one they like. Maybe they use a couple of them if they, you know, depending on uh, the context of the line. And you record it. You talk with them. You sign your contracts to get paid. 
and then you go home. And then they, they called back and we did a second day where it was more so a, a publicity day where they had camera crews. They had, uh, the, they had the EA and the DICE camera crew and they had the Lucasfilm camera crew and they had Matt and I both there and they shot some footage of Matt and I together in the studio recording lines together. But I had already recorded all my lines and Matt hadn't recorded his yet, but we did that so they would have that footage so you can all watch the behind the scenes. Then they shot some of me shooting, uh, re reading my lines on my own. Then I went and did a phone interview that was written, I believe, by, was it Alex Kane? Alex Kane uh, wrote the interview and did some interviews on camera, interviews with them. Did one for StarWars.com, which is out now, and you can see that. And then I did one for uh, EA and DICE. And that one, I'm sure, will come out at some point soon if it has not already. I don't know if it has or not. And then, uh, then I left again. So two sessions. I recorded two different sessions. Uh, so there's your uh, big question. Oh, do you guys get paid a bunch of money for this? No, we don't get paid a bunch of money for these. And no, it's not drawn out into really long, uh, recording sessions. We do it for the art of it and the love of star Wars. And that's why we do it. And that's why we love it. And we do it. So all of you can have a wonderful gaming experience and that's, that's what it is. And that's what we did. And that's, that was my battlefront two experience. And I'm very grateful for it. So that is the big Battlefront 2 uh, story and experience that I had, and I'm glad everybody loves the game, and I'm so excited for all of you to play as Obi-Wan Kenobi. I am excited to play as Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, I am excited to hear my voice in there, and I hope that they do more. And thank you to uh, Lucasfilm, to Disney, and of course to EA and DICE, DICE uh, putting together a fantastic game. So that's James Arnold Taylor Talks. Battlefront 2. And that'll be the title of this episode just to get all of you to listen. James Earl Taylor talks to Dave Filoni and talks Battlefront 2. That'll be the title of this. This is a boy for Star Wars fans. This is the episode I'm I'm putting all my eggs in the basket that maybe my listenership will increase by this episode. The fans of Dave Filoni, the fans of Battlefront, the fans of Star Wars will find my podcast and listen to this podcast today and go, "Wow, I like that. I'll come back and listen to more. There you go. That's that's what this is. So what we should do, because now the other thing I really wanted to do is I wanted to address some of the emails, the fantastic emails I have been getting from all of you. And we are going to do live phone calls soon enough. Maybe, you know, the thing is, is I may wait till after the holidays to do that just because there's just so much going on in everybody's lives and trying to kind of, you know, coordinate those things. So maybe in July, uh, in July, in January, the other J month, well, June as well. Uh, maybe in January, we will start taking your calls and doing the live calls to the chat podcast. Okay. For now, so many of you are doing such a great job. Uh, hey, let's, let's bring in Mr. Announcer guy, or should we get Mr. Announcer guy's brother? One of his brothers, his, his younger brother, not the older brother. I like, well, let's bring all, all of you, all, Mr. Announcer Guy. Yes, James. So you have an older brother. What's he sound like? That's Charlton, the older brother to Mr. Announcer Guy. Oh, hey, Charlton. Hello, James. And then the younger brother is like the sweet, you know, uh, kind of like uh, romantic comedy voice announcer. Yes, James. That's my younger brother, George. George. And he's going to give you a little story about love. Oh, yeah, yeah. So what if George tells us how to send an email to Ask Jat? So let's, well, first off, let's cue the, uh, oh, so wait, oh, gosh, man, so many characters on the show now. Uh, for the, again, if you're like a first time person, let's bring in Jerry, who cues the music, the music guy. Jerry, are you there? Hey, James, I'm Jake. You're Jake or you're Jerry? No, no, that just means I'm swell. Oh, right. Yeah, that's right. You say everything's Jake. And then you call me Jake. That's right, James. So can you cue the music for Ask Jat? Billy Billy Bat, I'll cue the music for Ask Jat. Yowza, yowza, yowza. All right. Hey, there it is. I like that music, Jerry. Thank you. You betcha, James. We'll see you later. Adios, amigos. Oh, he's bilingual. So, but now, Mr. Announcer Guy. Yes, James. You're still here. Yes, I am. And your older brother? Yes, that's me, Charlton. And that's great. And your younger brother? That's right, James. I'm George. You're all here, but I want George. Well, you know what? Oh, hey, 
Could all three of you tell people how to send an email to Ask Chat? It would be our pleasure, James. Well, how did I do that just now? That's what I want to know. <laughs> okay. If you'd like to send a question to James Arnold Taylor on the JetCast, simply go to jamesarnoldtaylor.com. Then in the top right-hand corner, click on the Jet Show button. That'll take you all the way over to the Jet Show page, where you'll then find the Choose a Topic. Make sure you choose the James Arnold Taylor podcast, the JetCast. Then type in your name, where you're from, and all the other information. And then... Write an email asking James anything you want to see if it'll show up right here on the James Arnold Taylor Podcast. It's just that easy. Well, thanks, guys. You're welcome, James. Our pleasure, James. We'll see you, buddy. All right. Yeah, they're nice. Okay, so Jerry cued the music. The announcer guys told you how to send an email. All we need now, oh, we need Bob to come in. And then, hey, Bob, read us the uh, emails. Hey, Bob, 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 Bob. Hey, Bob. Uh, yes, uh, uh, hello there, uh, uh, Mr. Taylor there, James. Uh, no, it's just James, not Mr. or Taylor. Taylor, James, Mr. No, no, you don't need to. It's all right, Bob. Anyways, Bob, how are you, first off? Are you doing okay? I am, uh, uh, no, I am I am doing more than okay. I am super duper diffily do. So, super duper differently do. Well, that's very nice. Okay. Well, um, you know, uh, people really like you already. I'm noticing in the comments of the show that people are already going, hey, Bob, 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 hey, Bob. You don't mind that, do you? Well, uh, no, no. I, I look at um, anything as a uh, form of uh, um, affection there that you do uh, in regard to my name. I think it's, I think it's quite wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. That's nice. Okay, so Bob, we've got, we have so many emails from so many sweet, well, speaking of sweet and wonderful people, the listeners of the James Arnold Taylor podcast, they're they are the best fans in the world, aren't they? Well, I would, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I would have to agree with you on that, James. Yes, absolutely. They are the uh, the best fans in the world. And they um, they have many different uh, emails and questions uh, for you. And I have them here. And then I'm going to read them and uh, ask and answer. Well, you'll answer them. And then I will, uh, I will, uh, I'll read another one. Okay. You know, you, you kind of remind me of Piglet. No, well, well um, okay. Oh, well, I like Piglet quite a bit. Okay. So what do you got for us, Bob? Who's uh, emailed us? Okay, uh, well, uh, the uh, first uh, email is from Keegan White. Keegan White. Yes, from the USA. Okay. And what does Keegan say? Uh, hello, James. I love your podcast and the voices that you do. I learned about you from your work in Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and found your YouTube channel from your Force Center interview. Uh, just a few ramblings. It's really cool that you are a Christian, as I am uh, as well, and it's good to hear from a Christian who is an entertainer. Also, I am uh, and planning to be a writer. I want to be an excellent writer. I have always been told to have determination and I will succeed, so I never thought about quitting, just getting better at it. I, if I ever write a script or something else, I would love for you to voice act in it. I'm much better at writing fiction than what this is, which is an email is what he's saying. <laughs> well, that's cute. Yeah, no, that is very funny. Okay. Uh, anyway, here are my questions. Have you ever heard of Adventures in Odyssey? And have you ever interviewed or whatever it would be called? It would be an audition. Right. Uh, for a part with them. If you've never heard of it, I suggest you check it out, and I feel like you would really like it. That's it for now. Thank you for your encouragement and everything you do on the podcast and everything else. Uh, that's Keegan White. Keegan White. All right. Thank you, Keegan. Uh, and thank you, Bob, for reading that. Uh, you're, oh, yes, you're uh, you're welcome. So, here's the thing, Bob. Uh, oh, yes. I actually know about Adventures in Odyssey. I do. And uh, the funny story, Keegan, that you would bring up Adventures in Odyssey. Now, for those of you that don't know what Adventures in Odyssey is, Adventures in Odyssey is a, it was like a radio play. And it's, uh, it is a Christian, it's a faith-based thing that has been going on for decades now. And it is, it's an audio adventure with these characters and all of this stuff. And the funny thing about it is I've known about it for many years. And I have tried to get on it. I've had agents ask them about it. I've prayed about it to be on it. They recorded it at a studio that I was recording several different other shows at, at the same time as them. So when you go to a recording studio, there's, you've got uh, various, a lot of them have various different recording rooms. So they could be recording three or four different TV shows at a time there in different studios within that one big building, right? And so the place that they record Adventures in Odyssey, <laughs> 
I it was recording uh, shows like Johnny Test and Scooby Doo. Uh, I mean, uh, countless other shows that I've done. And I have, I can't even tell you the amount of times I've been there while they've been recording Adventures in Odyssey with all my friends that are voice actors and they've been in it and they've never cast me. They've never uh, asked. I have, I have asked, I've tried to get on there. I don't know what Adventures in Odyssey has against using James Arnold Taylor on their show, but for some reason they have never used me. They have never, and I have sought them out. I, and, and years ago, years ago, I believe I had an audition with them. Uh, like a special audition and they still never, they never used me for anything. And I, here's the thing that's funny about it. Now, for those of you, again, as I say, if you, if you know the show, you know the show, if you don't know the show, it's a, it's a faith-based thing. So it's, it's, it's for Christians and it's written by Christians and made by Christians, but the voice actors that are on there, I know because I know all of them. They're all my friends. Uh, 98% of them are not of the Christian faith, which is fine. That's fine. That's totally fine. However, I find it ironic and somewhat silly and, and, and kind of ridiculous that the one guy that is like openly Christian in Hollywood as a voice actor, the like openly blatantly Christian can't get hired on the Christian voiceover job. And it's an, it's a thing where they require, uh, the actors to have vocal range. The last I checked, I've been known to do a couple of voices. Now I'm not trying to toot my own horn or come off like I'm full of myself here. And if this, this, this is the first time you're hearing this podcast, you're going to go, boy, this guy is going on about stuff. No. Um, I just think it's very funny and I don't know what that is. I don't know why I can't get hired on adventures in Odyssey. But if anybody from Adventures in Odyssey is listening to the James Arnold Taylor podcast, you know what? I'd love to do your show. And I've I've said that literally for decades and cannot can't can't get hired by you guys. So I don't know what it is. So, Keegan, there you go. Uh, There's my uh, very long answer. It it bums me out. It actually bums me out because I I would love to be on that. I mean, it seems like a perfect fit, doesn't it? Yet they're not. They're not interested. They've got their bases covered. They've already got people like me, you know, (laughs) anyways, that's, you know, that's how it goes. That's the way it is. And that also just goes to tell you that it doesn't matter how big of a name you are in voiceover or in showbiz. If you're a voice actor, you can't just get whatever you want. You have to, you know, some things just never come to you. So there you go. But maybe just maybe now they'll hear this and they'll feel guilty and they'll hire me for a, a, a one-off or something. All right. <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, it's all right. It's all right. God bless them. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful show that they do. It's a wonderful thing that they do. I think it's fantastic. And uh, there you go. All right, Bob. Oh, that's a, that's a very, uh, that's an interesting, uh, that's kind of a sad story. Well, it's not sad. Well, it's sad for you as you, uh, you would really love to do the voices in it. I would. But what are you going to do? Wait, what are you going to do? Maybe just read another email. Oh, may, oh, yeah, oh, sure. I see what you did there. You did a little segue. Yes, I did. You catch on, Bob. Hey, Bob. Okay, uh, our next one is from uh, Leela or Layla S. from the uh, United States. Leela. You could say Leela or Layla. I wonder. L-E-L-A, huh? That's right. Okay. Well, Leela, Layla, uh, I'm sorry if, it, well, uh, hopefully one of those is pronouncing it properly. Uh, so go ahead, Bob. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. Hi, James. Firstly, I am so uh, happy to dis- uh, you decided to start a podcast. I'm enjoying it immensely and look forward to new episodes. Secondly, I loved meeting you and Anna Graves at Salt Lake City Fan X this past September and hope to see you back there in the future. And yes, I came to the wedding. Oh, <laughs> the wedding. Okay, so let me just stop you for a second, Bob. So uh, she's talking about, I went to a Comic-Con in Salt Lake City earlier this year. And in fact, you can see the video on my YouTube channel of of the wedding that I went to officiate. Uh, me and the lovely voice actress, Anna Graves, who played the Duchess of Teen on Clone Wars, we went to officiate a wedding. We actually went and married a couple that were uh, cosplaying as Obi-Wan Kenobi and the Duchess of Teen. And you can see the full video of the wedding and my whole journal of the adventure on my YouTube channel. Just go to my YouTube channel, James Arnold Taylor, uh, search for James Arnold Taylor, find that channel, subscribe to the channel, and then watch that video. You'll enjoy it quite a bit. So anyways, this person was at the wedding. Uh, Go ahead and continue, Bob. Uh, Thank you. Yes. So anyways, I did have a couple of questions regarding your work on Star Wars that I am very uh, curious about. Until recently, I did not realize that you and the rest of the cast would often record together. 
Well, no, yeah. I mean, we always recorded together. Pretty much uh, 99% of the time we recorded together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Well, I, I, back to her letter. I imagine you must feed and bounce off each other. Uh, all, uh, but do you ever have any visual aids to help you in your performance? Visual aids? No. Um, generally, no. We Most of the animation wouldn't be done. However, you go back in sometimes and, well, go ahead and continue reading then. Yeah, let me let me finish before you answer. Obviously, the animation isn't done, but do you and the cast ever have anything like storyboards to give you a better idea of the situation your characters are in? I realize this is the reason you have a director during recording, but again, I was just interested. Okay, so let me stop you there. Let me take part one of this question. No, we just have the script. We get the script when we go in, and we generally don't get to read it beforehand. Dave Filoni would always be very descriptive in telling us the stories and all of that. By the way, Dave Filoni, coming up later on the podcast here, I'm going to be uh, playing part one of my interview with Dave Filoni from many years ago. All right. So, uh, but no, never any visual aids or anything. If we go back and do ADR, which is like six months later after that episode has been recorded. So we record all the voices first. We record them as a cast together in the room together, like an old radio play. Then they take that anime or that audio and they animate to that. Now, they have done some basic animation since it's all done in the computer, but none of the lip flap. They haven't animated the lip flap. So then they go back and they animate all of our lip flap and our movements, and they usually have cameras on us to catch any movements we do, and they make the characters kind of move and act the way we did. Then, if they have pickup lines or changes, then we might go back in and do ADR, automatic dialogue replacement or additional dialogue recording is what they call it sometimes, two different names for it. And we hear the little beeps, beep, beep, beep. And then where the fourth beep is, that's where you would come in and give our lines. So if you have to do pickup lines or changes, that's the only time where we would actually see any visual things. And that's after we've already recorded everything. So, uh, oh, and then is there more? Oh, yeah. uh, Yes. Along the same line, I thought uh, the animation is done to your recordings. But do you ever find that you have to come back to do a redub like live action often uh, does? Well, I actually already answered that. Yes. Oh, yeah, actually, you already did. So I appreciate your time in indulging my curiosity. Thank you. And to save you the uncertainty of pronouncing my name, it is said, Leela. Oh, look at that. She already said it at the end. Yeah. Well, we should have read before. Well, Bob, you read these emails beforehand. Why didn't you tell me that? I forgot. Okay. All right. Leela. Okay, Leela. We said Layla as well, but forget we said Layla. It's Leela. Okay. Uh, the other, the, the, okay, the other thing is on that one, Bob. Hey, Bob, let me just say, uh, Leela, I also want to thank you for the uh, other personal note that you put in the email. I think it's wonderful. God bless you. And I, uh, you're in my prayers. And I think that uh, that's, that's wonderful to hear you say what you said. So thank you so much. See, that's now, Leela and I have our own little kind of like uh, uh, inside baseball story going on there too. What do you think of that, Bob? Well, I, I mean, I, 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 I think that's fine. Although the listeners may be going, well, James, that's not fair. No, no. Here's what it does, Bob. If people have a question for me in an email, they can write that. And then if they also want something personal to say to me, like Leela did, uh, just telling a personal story and thanking me for what I'm doing here, you can do that. And then I say thank you to that. And then it makes it more personal and it makes people actually want to write to me more, which is what we want. So your segment is even bigger. And then you get even more airtime, Bob. Hey, Bob. Oh, you're absolutely right. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that I think, um, you know, because uh, the uh, 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 Billy, the uh, engineer, my uh, my nephew. Uh, yeah, Billy. Uh, Billy! <laughs> hey, hi, Uncle Bob. Oh, hello, Billy. Uh, so, hey, wait, no, wait, wait, wait. I can actually say this. And all of my friends uh, that are listening in the United Kingdom will appreciate this. So, uh, Billy? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. James. Uh, just James. Uh, James Taylor. Just James. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Okay, whatever. Billy. Yes. So, Bob's your uncle? Yes. <laughs> you don't get it. No, I mean, no, I mean, I do. I, yes, he is my uncle. No, no, no. Bob's your uncle? Yes. Yes, yes, I am. No, you guys, you guys don't get it. Oh, come on. That's a funny joke. Billy's uncle. Oh, anyways. All right, Billy, get out of here. Well, I was actually, I was calling him in because he was, he had slipped me a note saying that we need to move it along because you have to have time to play your interview with uh, Dave Filoni. All right. Okay. Yeah. The interview. Okay. Well, we'll get to more emails um, uh, another time. So many fantastic emails. So many, 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 many emails to answer. I think the next episode or one of the next episodes, I may do just the whole episode may just be answering some of your emails because you all ask me so many wonderful things and make so many wonderful comments. So thank you to all of you that are commenting and writing me personal letters and, and 
letters of thanks and commenting on the show and asking questions for the show. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. Hey, Bob. Thanks so much for your taking the time to read the emails for us here on this Ask Jat segment. Well, it is my pleasure, James. And there he goes. Okay, yes, it is the moment you've been waiting for where I sit down and play you uh, sections of as a, one of the fans. Again, I can't find who, where, where was it? Oh, I should have asked Bob because he reads through all the emails. Somebody in here actually said, if you do this section, call it the Filoni Files. And I thought that was funny. Okay, the Filoni Files. Good. That's what we're calling it. We're going to call it the Filoni Files. So I need, oh gosh, you know, I need like a, a piece of music that's kind of x files kind of, what should I? Uh, hey, Jerry. Yeah, James. Do you have something that's kind of x files but not x files so I don't get sued because it doesn't that, and it's, but it has the feel of like an X-Files because this is called the Filoni Files, and so I have a little bit of music. You know what I'm saying, right? I sure do, James. How about this? Ooh, I like that. All right, that's the Filoni Files theme music now. Every time we do this, we'll uh, play this music. Thanks, Jerry. You betcha, James. This is where I... Uh, so, okay, so picture it. Um, Rancho Obi-Wan back in... I want to say it's like 20, 2013, maybe. And I sit down with Dave Filoni for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, here was the deal. I was doing... I was sitting in for my friend Tom Wilson for his podcast, Big Pop Fun, which is still out there and you can listen to. Uh, he doesn't do it anymore, but there's still over, I think, 100 episodes that he did and it's a fantastic podcast and you should listen to it and subscribe to it and go back and listen to all the wonderful people he interviewed including myself uh okay and um anyways i was sitting in for him and i did three interviews that were going to end up as episodes on his show and this one never made it why didn't it make it well because um he ended up coming back and not needing the episodes and i realized you know what i'm gonna hold on to this and maybe someday just someday this uh i'll put on my own podcast and now here it is all these years later and that's exactly what I'm doing. I sat down with Dave Filoni. And the funny thing is, is listening back to this, you'd think, so it was pretty much right after the Clone Wars was canceled. And this was Dave and I talking. And my goal in this interview was to not just talk about Star Wars. My goal was to just get to know Dave Filoni and to hear him tell some stories of his own life as an artist and a director and a writer and a producer and a creative person. So what you're going to hear here is the first uh, 12 or 15 minutes of my interview with Dave Filoni, one-on-one, -on -one, talking about everything but Star Wars. But we actually do end up talking about Star Wars. All right, take a listen. Okay, let's Good see. I'm, I'm recording. So <laughs> fancy. This, this is, thing. yeah, I know. Look at that. That's pretty good. <laughs> so I am here with Dave Filoni. And, you know, as I was telling you just before, it's been eight years now that we've known each other. It's crazy. And before that eight years, we both had said Star Wars a lot in our day to day vocabulary. But now, yeah. Has there, I mean, are there hours that go by that you don't have to say the word Star Wars? That's the thing. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, my life is largely, um, largely, fortunately, or not the same. I mean, I think that now there's a lot of, um, you know, it's just the, 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 the way it interacts with my life has changed a little bit in that, you know, I'm not so much of the learner to the master as I was now. I'm expected to do things more. Sure on my own, which is fine, which is, which was always part of the deal. But it, the strangest part is just that working on Clone Wars being that, you know, weekly, daily thing for eight years was a big deal. I mean, and it filled our lives in every way. And it was, yeah. no matter what else was going on, there was a security of having that series there, Yeah, you know, and very much, oh, we're going to record, I'll see, you know, D, I'll see James, I'll see Matt, I'll see Ash, I'll see Kat, I'll see, yeah, I won't see we'll Tom, see but I'll other. talk to Tom because Tom's in every episode. Tom Kane, the voice of Yoda, yeah, uh, so, doing it at ISDN. It's well, been a shift for us, that's for sure. Here's the shift even more. This interview, we're not going to talk about that. That's crazy. We're going to talk about Dave Filoni because- I have nothing to say. Throughout- <laughs> Boring subject. You have a lot to say <laughs> because throughout our eight-year friendship, I have always been fascinated by you as, as a filmmaker, as a director, as a writer, and as an artist. Mm -hmm. And you are tried and true an artist in every form, in my opinion. I get I try, to say it. I appreciate that. I'm hosting. I get to say it. <laughs> so, I, you know, how did how did your love for art happen? Was that from your your parents, your family? Where did that I start? I would say you? so. I mean, art was very encouraged in my my household growing up, and 
my parents were both artists. My mother could draw. My father is an architect. He can draw. Oh, he's They're an architect. Both, oh, he's an architect. Yeah, very into opera. He he studied opera, theater, and stage design. So, at a very young age, we would be taken to operas and plays, and very much interacting with that world of uh-huh. theater and. He specialized in acoustics within theater, so he really? restored a lot of old theaters. And my mother was a singer, so she was part of the Tanglewood Choir for a while in Boston. So there was a lot of... When you said you want to be an artist or you like to draw, that was something that was really, I think, well accepted in my house, as of sure. course. Sure. And I, I find that... The, and it's interesting, I think, for parents to note that most children draw, right? Most yeah. of them are very comfortable with that, and they draw and they... Every parent puts up pictures their kids draw, and then (laughs) at a certain point, someone says, well, that doesn't look like that. And then that confidence, I think, gets broken. And then people just kind of fall away, and they stop drawing, and it becomes about, is this good or not, instead of just, it's fulfilling something that I enjoy. (sighs) And I mean, you see that and, in kids, and, right? Yeah, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a daughter and it's like, uh, she's always asking me because I do a little mm-hmm. art. She's always asking me, well, how do you draw a body? How do you draw hands? <laughs> and I'm like thinking, well, go ask Dave Filoni. But um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's so true. It, yeah. it gets stifled in people. Of and course. So that wasn't the case, I'm sure, in your home then. No, but, but it it's a struggle. I mean, you have to be supported and, and I think people give you some confidence, but you have to be dedicated to to studying and training like anything yeah. else. People like to, I think, just say, well, that person's gifted. And that right. that's true. People can be gifted, but a lot of hard work goes into honing that gift and making it something more. I remember that on a funny thing, and a lot of people that, our, our age will remember this, yeah. but Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid, very yeah. much a taboo thing, right? But yeah. when the figures came out for these action figures, uh, I wanted the action figure War Duke really badly. I thought he was just <laughs> so cool. He was like, he had kind of like a Boba Fett like helmet that was blue with these bat wings on it. Right. I mean, Seth Green just got me the action figure, him and Matt Senrich, a couple years ago. They sent it to me on the card. Because they knew I liked it. And um, That's I wanted cool. this figure really bad. Yeah. And my mother, you know, she finally gave in and I was able to get this action figure for Christmas. A major coup, <laughs> right? At, at that at that time. Yeah. And one of the first times, the reason I bring this up is one of the first times I really remember being able to draw or thinking, wow, I can actually maybe draw. Yeah. Was I was drawing the picture of War Duke on the package. I was recreating the doing? drawing, the painting that was on there. And my brother looked at it and said, wow, that really looks like that. I'm like, right? <laughs> this is, I'm <laughs> kind of getting this. this here. I can do this. And that was a big kind of moment where I thought, oh, cool. Yeah. Maybe this is, but then you really have no idea how do you make a job out of that. You just really have no so idea. So how do you make a job out of that? Because, I mean, everybody knows you from Star mm-hmm. Wars. Everybody knows you really as, you know, I mean, it's, you got George Lucas and you got Dave Filoni. And that's really, <laughs> and, and you know. That is really the way that it is, especially nowadays within the realm of Star Wars fans that are growing up with Star Wars, mm-hmm. Clone Wars and all. It was so affected by what you did and your vision for it. And I got to, I, I got, you know, front row seat to <laughs> it all. Row. <laughs> it was great. But how did you start? Did you, because you worked on King of the Hill. You yeah. worked on uh, um, uh, Airbender. Uh, I mean, King of the Hill is really the first one. I mean, I guess that it's just it's so funny to me when you look back and how things occur but stories i i I really believe stories and reading stories and absorbing them and the we call them pop culture now they're the stories exist because we relate to them on every level no matter how far-fetched the situations seem the humanity of the the story rings true in our own life and if you're dealing with hollywood and movie making Mm -hmm. you know and And I'm growing up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You know, it's just like what Luke Skywalker says. If there's a bright center of the universe, I'm on the planet it's farthest from. And, you know, we didn't know anything about the Hollywood scene in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We had um, Romero making zombie movies (laughs) locally. And we had one animation studio, maybe two. But, you know, nothing that was really going to jump me into where I wanted to be. I remember thinking I'd like to make Star Wars kind of movies, but I had no one to help me figure out what did that mean and how do you do that? And were you thinking specifically animation or live action at the time? Well, 
or didn't I like Star Wars movies, but I thought I don't have the skill set for that because I like to draw. Yeah. And drawing is more like Disney. So maybe I should draw. And what really solidified it for me was my uh, junior high uh, and high school art teacher, Dave Schenefeld. He took, Mr. Schenefeld took us to um, an artist to visit a real artist living in the south side of Pittsburgh. Really? And this was a guy that made his living selling paintings, paintings of wow. the local area and okay. culturally. And and uh, I, I don't know what struck me that day, but I just happened to ask him. I said, well, what do you do if you're not selling paintings? Yeah. And he said, well, I pump gas. And I yeah. was like this, hitting the brakes. I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I pump gas. He's like, look, kid, I got to eat. Yeah. It's and you're like just not always selling tables. art. Yeah. And that was kind of the reality of being this, fine artist the romantic view of that kind of melted away and i was like wow that's i don't know if i can deal with that level of stress i better figure out a way to make this a job and because <laughs> yeah. i always loved music and and uh and do you play music theater i, I was in the band i Were played you? trumpet I was in band. yeah i, I played saxophone band. see yeah, there, band. There. you yeah, seem like a sax yeah. i'll say you uh, seem like a sax player at the glasses <laughs> i was very cool i was very, very but you cool. have one of those big straps <laughs> yeah that's right and yeah, so but are. but so uh, yeah this artist and i thought well i need to figure out a job here a way to work and i love the music because of my parents and the love of opera and wagner and things of that nature and i love the moving picture and i loved when those things came together yeah very famously with john williams yeah they come together beautifully so fantasia and things like that as well that i liked and then the tv series like dungeons and dragons and yeah. robotech and i thought well animation seems great and maybe i can make these animated things and make it like star wars so um th that's when i went to edinburgh state university and studied animation which was a very small state school where you could actually study those things yeah um, back when i was young and yeah that led to you know meeting you know a, a friend that i'm one other guy in pittsburgh i knew pete mikas who was from uh pittsburgh pennsylvania he had a job at film roman yeah. Talking to him and Phyllis Craig was how I got a job at Film Roman and started okay. on King of the Hill. So, but I never thought, I kind of realized halfway through my college education that what I should have been was a model builder or then a CG computer animator. Oh, really? Because that was where everything was going to make Star Wars. And I think you did okay. I will, but you didn't know at the time, <laughs> at right? The time, no yeah. one could predict that CG animation was going to become what it was back in 1992 when I was first going to college. I was doing all traditional animation. In fact, I never touched a computer in regards to my job in animation until I started working on Clone Wars in 2005. Really? Even in 2004 on The Last Airbender, when we were doing that TV series on the first season, yeah. we didn't use Cintiq tablets. We didn't have email yeah. in our office. Not the regular standard crew. And we did not. Sure. It was all hand-drawn on paper. So if you went into my office on Airbender, it was very much like a you know, drawings all over the floor, yeah. piled up, drawing and drawing. I have boxes at home of just filled with pictures of Aang and Sokka and Katara and Appa and all these characters from Airbender. Because we just drew and drew and drew and drew and drew. And that was... It's your retirement, by the way. You can just... Yeah, you know, I guess. Can, but <laughs> set up a table well, at a con and there it's It's hard, done. though, because <laughs> someone like wanted to auction something off. And I went through that box and... Everything in there is just more, it's so personal because you remember yeah. the people you were working with. You remember what was happening when you created it. And it was such a great time. I was so driven on that show because my friends created it. Yeah, Mike uh, DiMartino and Brian Canisco. And they had done this great thing, I thought, which was they created their own show. Mm -hmm. It was something that they loved. It was a style that I loved. Right. And I felt very responsible to them to say i have to be a part of making this successful yeah. for these guys because they had sunk so much effort into getting this thing made in the first place because nickelodeon yeah. is not like a big action adventure studio no it's you know that show was very different than anything else we were different. saying yeah so it i thought we were going to need to really give us everything we had so we would be working there late Mm -hmm. working all day all night and was just it, fun, though? it was super fun because yeah. you knew everything that you did was going into this work for these friends of yours and yeah. i mean the 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 directors were me and uh, Giancarlo volpe who went on to work with me on clone wars right. 
Lauren McMullen, who was really one of the first directors I ever learned from. We had Anthony Leoy directing, who was also one of the first people I met in animation at King of the Hill. So it was this group of people that we all knew each other. And I, I think that makes a huge difference on these shows. When you have these shows that are bound by people that know each other and that there's so much passion going into the work yeah. because they want to make it great for each other. Yeah. You know, that, that was a great show. It was very hard to leave that show. But very you, hard. You you did, and it had you know, to, yeah. And I would love well, to I told touch you that joke, right? Yeah, well, you didn't. You may have told me the one where tell. I said that someone at John Carl asked me. He said, "Dave, what would it take to get you to leave Airbender? Because you love it yes, so much." I, I said, "Oh yeah, if George Lucas calls and offers me a job, I'll go." And we just started <laughs> laughing. Thought it was the funniest thing. But and I would love to tell that story. <laughs> uh, but and I want to if we if we can if Whatever you're okay you with that because I think it's fascinating. The the thing is is you were a kid that grew up loving all of this. Mm -hmm. And now you're a kid that gets to play it in a yeah. whole different way. <laughs> but you really Very changed different. the face of it for, for myself, certainly, for my family, for my, my life, for all the actors on the show. But it's because it goes back to what you learned from these shows where it was a family. There's, mm -hmm. as actors, you work on shows, especially in cartoons, animation, and you do an, a gig and you're on it for a couple seasons and then you're gone. And you go, oh, that's great. And I'll see you at the next one. <laughs> Clone Wars ends and there's a different type of mourning, if you will. Yeah, from it, in it's very strange. It's just, we are a family. And that was really due to what you created, Dave. And I want to oh, just thank you that, James. for that thank because you. when we got into the studio, it was just, it was fun. It was just a fun family. Well, I want to do things differently, especially with the actors. I mean, I didn't know anything about voice directing when i started clone wars and luckily for me we had the amazingly talented andrea romano yeah. um, at the beginning of clone wars and i really absorbed a lot from her in the beginning but at the end of the day to george he's like you're the director you have to direct the actors so yeah. i had to assume that role and you know for me it was always I always want everything to get better and better at every phase of production. Mm -hmm. The best way you can do this is director to me is not someone that says, this is the way I want it. Yeah. I'm going to bend your will to be mine. <laughs> I'm going to do it for you. If you can't get it right. <laughs> I don't like to work that way at all. I, it's my job to be as specific as I possibly can to say, this is how I see it. Yeah. Okay. This is what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. but I also have to accept what can you bring to that? And that's true for everybody on my production. Yeah. You know, the PAs, the voice talent, the animators. You have to get everybody in tune with what you're trying to achieve. And this is the vision for it. And you're basically guiding everyone towards this vision. And yeah. I found that when you empower people within that vision, when you as actors were empowered to understand the story and the characters, mm -hmm. um, it really became you became the character. I well, didn't have to yeah. tell you how to be the character because you already were. And if you had questions, yeah. um, you know, I could guide you. And, and really I developed that skill greatly with Ian yeah. Abercrombie. I mean, he was so veteran an actor. He could have walked in there and looked at me and been like, who's this guy? Why? I don't <laughs> care who he is. But he never did. He was so prepared. And sweet and humble. And Ian Amazing. Abercrombie, yeah, just, uh, and, and such a comedic guy. Oh my gosh, people don't even know. I mean, I guess they do from Seinfeld. Yeah, from but, Seinfeld and everything. But yeah. on, on this show, it's just- Spectacular. Yeah. yeah. And okay, so <laughs> there was all of that. And we always, we always laughed. We always laughed. And yeah. we would always, again, it goes back to the art. If we were having a conversation about something or we talked, you would be sketching out a character that you make up from that. I yeah. think one of our last ones, <laughs> you did one on one that we, we, we won't get into, but uh -oh. it was a very funny character. <laughs> well, what are you uh, going to do, right? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just so funny that at the end of the day, George always used to tell me, he said, Dave, if we can't have fun making this show. Yeah. How can we have fun? You yeah. know, if you can't have fun working on Star Wars and I agree with him there. I mean, it's, it's, it should be fun. It's high pressure it's high stress everybody has an opinion you know? about star wars oh my gosh yeah and oh, yeah. yeah so what can you do but you've got to laugh and enjoy it and that i think is what came across well you it. try to stay true to the you know the funny and the laughter is a big part of it and we live in a time where everybody wants everything to get dark yeah it's not dark <laughs> enough and it's not evil enough and brooding, you know, not brooding. Yeah. and we had some very dark episodes of clone wars no doubt but 
I do think there was a point where that experiment was, I don't want to say it ever went too far, but, you know, it's, is that really Star Wars? Yeah. Is that what you felt when you watched A New Hope or was the thing that you got the most out of it the 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 type of feeling of inspiration that this is just fantastic and we can overcome things, you know? And, and in some ways, I think when we did the darker things like the Darth Maul arc yeah. with the teen dying and, and those things, that it was okay because we hadn't really gone there so much in Star Wars. So we were exploring some new ground, but... Yeah. At the end of the day, if you really want to call it Star Wars, it has to be an adventure. Gotta have some fun. Above everything else. And being dark is just one aspect of that galaxy. But we're trying not to talk so much about Star Wars yeah, in this interview. Come on. It's hard not to come back to it. <laughs> oh, yeah, see, the next time we come in, we're going to get back to it and talk about other things besides Star Wars. But um, what a wonderful guy Dave Filoni is. And what a wonderful time we had uh, sitting there talking. Um, I can still see it clear as day. We were up in Steve Sansweet's office at Rancho Obi-Wan. Thank you, Steve Sansweet. Thank you for being so sweet. He is. He's. It's not just his name. He's actually a sweet guy. And uh, thank you for letting us do that interview. There's more to come on the Dave Filoni interview. So this will get you that are new to subscribe to my podcast and listen and come back and listen to uh, next week and the week after, because I think I'll break it up into three segments and do uh, this as that so you can hear that if you're interested in... This is the thing I liked about it. I like that it's not just telling you... We're not just sitting here talking about Star Wars characters. We're talking about just life. Because that's what all of us creatives do when we are working and stuff. We talk about life and stuff. And so this was more be a fly on the wall listening to Dave and I talk about movies and art and TV and things that have inspired us and moved us and, uh, and a bit of his story that I, I don't know if you hear that story anywhere else really on any other podcast. So I feel like it's kind of a cool exclusive thing. So thanks Dave Filoni for doing that all those years ago and not knowing that it wouldn't ever see the light of day until five years later. There it is. Uh, and, uh, there you go. I hope you all enjoyed that. I think we might have a little time for a get to know Jat. There's the music. Where's the man? Reginald. Uh, Reggie. Uh, Re Reginald, don't call me Reggie. I'm right here. Ah, whoa. God, you snuck up right behind me like that. Right. I should say boo. No, don't. Yeah, stop it, Reginald. Or I'll call you Reggie. Don't do that. All right. So, uh, get to know Jat. This is the segment of the show where you, Reginald Blythewood III, ask me, James Arnold Taylor the, the first, um, questions about me and my personal life it kind of, kind of, people kind of get to know me on a different level, different layer. Right. I could have said all that. I know, but you didn't. And so I'm taking the reins of this section, even though you are technically the host of this little segment. I am the host of it. And, but you did a good job of describing it. So that's good. I'll let that go. Right. Okay. So what's your question for me today? Would you just let me, now let me take it from here. All right. Okay. Sorry. Why must we always fight, Reggie? Reginald. Reginald, don't call me Reggie. Because you never stop harassing me. I try. You try to harass me? No, I try not to harass you. Right. Let me look in my notes. Okay, no, wait, wait, wait. See, you just did that thing. You just, like, licked your finger. What is that? Right, well, I needed to turn the page. Right, I've never understood that. I'm kind of a germaphobe guy. I've noticed that about you. Yeah, and this whole licking your finger and then touching a page to turn it? Where, who decided that was a good idea? Blech. And then, like, say, I don't want to touch that book after you've touched it and put your spit all over it and your spitty fingers. Are you quite done? Oh, I'm just saying, it's, I've always thought that's a little weird, a little gross. Right, let me just turn the page. Oh, you did it again! Stop it. Here's the question for today for Get to Know Jet. James. Yes? How do you handle stress? How do I handle stress? How do I handle stress? Must you always repeat everything I say? Well, it's just, uh, yes, I must repeat everything you say. Stop it. The way I handle, that's a great question, Reggie, Reginald. You're walking a very fine line with the name. But yes, I know it's a good question. It's my question. That's why I asked you. So please answer. We're running out of time. Okay, sorry. You're rushing me now. Um, how do I handle stress? Biggest thing in the world. Stress is, stress is a huge thing. How many of you are stressed right now? Are you stressed right now? Well, you stress me out. No, not you, Reginald. The the people listening. Um, if you're stressed right now, first off, I'm sorry. 
Because I, first off, I think that that helps. Knowing somebody is, has compassion for you and, and wants the best for you, know that, that I do. I do. I do this for you individually, all of you. I'm thinking about you. I'm hoping for the best for all of you. And I don't want you to be stressed. Here's the thing about stress. The wisest man that ever lived, not, so, not King Solomon, although King Solomon was known as the wisest man that ever lived. Uh, I think Christ was the wisest man that ever lived, even though he was not just man, he was God incarnate, um, said, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Be anxious for nothing. Well, that's easy for you to say, James, or that was easy for him to say or whatever. I've got problems. Yes, we all have stress. So the first way I handle stress, Reginald, don't call me Reggie. Right. Is to accept that things get stressful. Right. Explain that. Well, just the sheer knowledge of the fact that there may be times in my life that are going to get me stressed or anxious allows me the ability to put into my brain that I can handle it because I have handled it and that I have been under stress many, many times in my life. Right. So what you're saying is by acknowledging it, accepting it, it becomes something that your brain then says, I can handle this. That is exactly right, Reginald. So that's what I want you to do. First things first, if you're stressed right now, first things first, very first things first is take a breath. Okay. Let's all breathe. Let's all breathe together. Come on now. Okay. I do this with you. So we're, what we're going to do is we're going to take a big deep breath in. Okay. We're going to take a breath in for four seconds. We're going to hold it for seven seconds. We're going to blow it out for eight seconds. Okay. So we take a breath in. And as we take that in, we take it in for four seconds. You understand what I mean? It's one, two, three, four. Ready? Okay. And then we're going to hold it for seven. And then we're going to blow it out for eight. Here we go. Now, that's like one of those things that on um, radio and stuff, they would call dead air because I wasn't saying anything, but I hope you all took the breath in and held it and then blew it out with me. Okay. Stress, the body starts creeping up, creeping up, creeping up because it's getting stressed out. So what do you do? Breathe. First thing to do when you know you're being stressed or getting stressed or coming up, coming down with stress is to acknowledge it, but then also step back from it. Okay. How do you step back from it? Stop, take a big, deep breath. Relax your body. When you let that air out, you blow all that air out. Envision, like I've talked about in the other episodes, you breathe in peace. You breathe out stress, okay? So take that big, deep breath in. Breathing is a key to it for me, Reginald. Right, I think that's brilliant. Then acknowledging that I'm gonna get stressed, that life is stressful. Right. There was a fact, there was a TED talk that my therapist actually told me about. And, um, I, you know, I don't, I think if you, if you search TED talk about stress, you should find it. It was this woman, brilliant doctor who's researched stress. And she basically found that people that kind of accept and embrace the stress of their life do much better. And I, I found that to be so true and something that I do. So I, I can't take any credit for that. Kelly McGonigal. How to Make Stress Your Friend. It's a TED Talk. Go to TED.com and look for How to Make Stress Your Friend. That is going to be a great piece uh, for you to watch and learn from, okay? Accepting that stress is an actual thing. And even though Christ said, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. How do you not be anxious? You, you don't be anxious by accepting the fact that sometimes you're going to get anxious. You go, what? It's true. I know that sounds crazy, but it's, it's accepting and dealing with things is how. And so knowing, he says, therefore, do not fret. He said, consider the birds. They don't fret or toil, yet they're fed every day. I know because we have a fountain in our backyard and all the birds in the neighborhood come and we watch them. And I remember this scripture every day when I, when I see that. Again, not to get preachy on you, just saying this is where I draw my inspiration from. And the scripture says, you know, look at the birds. And it's so true. Just look at these little birds. Look at the animals. Animals don't stress out and fret. When they're in the wild, I mean, yeah, sure. Um, a, a rabbit is like, okay, I don't want to get eaten. But their fight or flight mode is in that moment where they have to be in fight or flight. And then after that, 10 minutes later, they're back eating grass again. Eh, everything's fine. They're always looking out, right? But they're not living stressed like we live stressed. So 
Take in the fact that there's stress in your life, that it's going to happen. And if you embrace the fact that you've been through stress before, you've gotten through it and you've gotten to the other side, that's going to help. Breathing is going to help. And just knowing and telling yourself, I do not have to be a victim of stress. Literally saying that out loud. Say it with me right now. I do not have to be a victim of stress. One more time. I do not have to be a victim of stress or to my stress. I like that better. I do not have to be a victim to my stress or the stress put upon me in this world. Life is stressful at times, yes, but I do not have to be a victim of it. I can handle this. I do handle it. Okay? You do. Even if you're somebody that has suffered from anxiety and panic, which I have suffered from in the past, you've gotten through to the other side. You're here right now listening to the podcast. So see, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to it's not going to steal your joy if you don't let it. Breathe, relax, know you're loved, know people around you are there for you, know that I'm there for you, know that stress does not have to overtake you. Panic and anxiety do not have to overtake you, okay? They do not have to. Check out that TED Talk. It's great stuff. Um, breathe. Get my book, Jet 365 it, it helps dealing with figuring things out. Know your plan in life. Know what you believe in life. Whether you believe in God or not, that again, I mean, I'm telling you, right? I mean, I want you to believe like I believe, but you don't have to believe like I believe. But know what you believe. If you don't know what you believe, it can be stressful in life. See, I know what I believe. I believe that there's a God that is bigger than me, that has created everything, and he's not worried about anything. He's not worried about anything. How do I know that? One, he himself said, do not worry about your life. Uh, two, he says throughout, I'm, I'm God. I created this stuff. I got it. I got it under control. And I've got you. I'm holding you. I know all the hairs on your head that are counted. I know the number of hairs. And James, you just lost three. Whoop. Yeah, because I'm losing my hair. No, uh, <laughs> we're all losing our hair. Anyways, I've got this. He says, I've got this. I've got you. Okay, so that's what I believe. That's what I know. That's how I deal with stress. Knowing those things, knowing that stress is a part of life helps me de-stress. Right. I think that's brilliant. I think it's wonderful. I think that's all the time we have for this. Yeah, I think you're right. So thank you, James. No, no. Thank you, Reginald. Don't call me Reggie. If my name is Reginald, don't say don't call me Reggie. I know, but that's kind of the fun part of it. You don't care. Goodbye, James. Goodbye, Reggie. Reg oh, Reggie. <laughs> Reggie, Reggie, Reginald. Sorry. Bye-bye. I'm ignoring you. All right. Okay, I like that. Um... Hey, has everybody had a fun time on the Jat Show and the Jat Cast today? A lot of fun stuff, a lot of good things, right? I think so. Talked a lot about uh, different stuff, Battlefront and Star Wars and all of that. But uh, we also, you know, I hope that I hope it was entertaining enough. Took some of your questions and stuff, and then you got that cool interview from Dave Filoni. Come back next week. There's going to be part two, part two of the Dave Filoni uh, interview, the Filoni Files, uh, and I will know by then which one of you. I will find that email and find out which one of you said that. The person that is is going. It was me, James. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyways. It's the James Arnold Taylor Podcast. Hey, Mr. Announcer Guy, do the thing and the read the thing and the thing and the thing. I've got the thing right here. Talking to myself, the James Arnold Taylor Podcast is a production of Yumi Go Inc. Recorded at Jet Studios. Engineered, written, recorded, and produced by, you guessed it, James Arnold Taylor. All voices are parody and should be construed as entertainment only. All music and sound effects used with permissions and licenses through backtracks, digital juice, production tracks, and partners in rhyme. James Arnold Taylor's Talking By Self, the podcast, copyright 2018, all rights reserved. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, let's do it like the Waltons, where I say goodnight, goodbye to all the characters. Goodbye, Mr. Announcer Guy. Goodbye, James. Goodbye, Mr. Announcer Guy's older brother, Charlton. Goodbye, James. Goodbye, Mr. Announcer Guy's younger brother, George. Well, goodbye, James. Goodbye, Jerry, the music guy. See ya, James. Everything's Jake. Goodbye, Billy. Goodbye, Mr. James, sir. Just James. Just James, sir. No, just James. Sir, James. Whatever. Goodbye, Bob. Hey, Bob, Bob. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yes, uh, toodle, toodaloo, James. Ah, toodaloo, yeah. Goodbye, Reggie. Stop it. Bye-bye.